You can now hear Movie Heaven Movie Hell on Stitcher. Stitcher is ready on demand. Listen anytime, anywhere. Stitcher is an award winning free app that lets you listen to all your favourite shows, plus discover from 20,000 news, entertainment and sports shows. You can also create your own custom playlists. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad and in over 4 million car dashboards. It's on demand and it's on the go. No downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. You can stream your favourite podcasts from Stitcher. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the App Store. And please, leave us a review and rating on Stitcher. Thank you. Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken, and... And I'm Keith Isles, and we are both independent filmmakers who enjoy discussing the good and bad of movies and related media. And for this uh, special Sherlock Holmes episode, we are pleased to be joined by a guest. We have writer, gamer, and Sherlockian, Eddie Webb, on, on the line. Hi, Eddie. Welcome to Hi. the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. How are you? Good. All good? Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Well, um, just for the benefit of our listeners, Eddie, before we sort of get stuck into the whole uh, Sherlock Holmes thing that we've got lined up, um, could you just sort of tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, what you enjoy, and uh, how you became a Sherlock Holmes fan? Sure thing. Um, uh, I am a uh, freelance video game and tabletop role-playing game writer and designer. Um, so I work with uh, companies to help them with their video game scripts. Uh, I also produce my own uh, games, tabletop role-playing games, card games, and the like, um, uh, uh, one of which uh, I just finally got out the door uh, called Pugmire, uh, which is a, a fantasy game involving dogs. Um, but uh, throughout my life, I've always been – interested in uh, uh, games, but also um, uh, media and how we relate to it. Uh, a lot of my personal interests come from uh, the migration of genre media into what we consider the classic media. Uh, so things like um, the 20s and 30s detect American detective fiction tradition, or even slightly earlier, uh, the, the British detective fiction tradition, how that Evolved into you know our Agatha Christie's, our uh, you know our, our Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle's, as it were, um, you know, but also uh, uh, your Philip Marlowe's, your Sam Spades, and how now we look at that stuff as oh that that's classic literature or that's at least given some more cachet, um, but at the time it was nothing of the sort. It was considered populist. It was very kind of you know uh, 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 dreadful for the Victorian church or pulp paperback for the modern things. It was magazine fiction. It was serialized. And I've always been fascinated how the stuff that is contemporary uh, that is said to be kind of consumptive media that you can know, throw away media sometimes evolves into something that's a little more poignant. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the reasons why I moved into the industry I did is because I feel like games are on that cusp. I feel like uh, uh, interactive entertainments of a wide variety of stripes are starting to reach that point where film was, you know, maybe 50 years ago, where it's like it's moved into okay, yeah, you can do artistic, intriguing things. Um, and Sherlock Holmes has always been for me an interesting character. I I, I started reading the stories when I was very very young. My father gave me. Uh, a collection of short stories, and, and my family gave me more and more of it because I just fell in love with it. Uh, uh, but it's always a good character because it's such a popular character. It's a bit like uh, a Superman is another good example, where it's a character most everyone has heard of uh, and most everyone respects to a certain degree, but it is not unapproachable literature. And mm -hmm. um, how each generation reinterprets or reapproaches that character and how the character is preceded, how the character is portrayed in media is distinctly different over time, but also it, it, it has 
different levels of, of respectability and appreciation. Um, you can take this character, it started off as just a way to make a, uh, a, a poor physician some extra cash published in magazines, uh, can move to extremely uh, a, a high levels of, of, of literary uh, critique or can become extremely trash fiction. And sometimes it's in the same decade or even in the same year where these different kind of approaches to the character come out. So that's a long way of saying is like, you know, my, my interests both professionally and personally kind of circle around uh, 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 that, that, that frisian, that intersection between the artistic and the populist. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really good way of putting it. And, uh, you, you know, that, that, thanks for that intro, because, uh, you, you, you know, I, I, I was um, I think it's I think it's fair to say that, you know, whereas William Shakespeare is is probably the most adapted mm -hmm. writer of all time. And Stephen King is like the m most adaptive living writer of, of mm -hmm. his work. I, I guess it's it's obviously fair to say that that Sherlock Holmes is is definitely the most adapted character in, yeah. in, in history, um, you know, as, as we stand at the moment. And, uh, you, you know, a, as you've rightly said, there have been varying quality over the years. <laughs> yes. um, however, you, you, you know, the, the, the character does still, um, you, you know, remain very relevant and, and very popular. Well, I mean, he's, he's never been more popular than he is currently, has he? Um, you, you know, yeah, yeah his, short, his short of his heyday. <laughs> I mean, you know, back, I mean, some people have said that uh, the best way to understand Doyle's popularity at the time is, is very akin to J.K. Rowling in a modern perspective. Um, so, I mean, he was intensely popular during the fraternity area, but I think it's fair to say that this time period right now is probably really far up there. The only other uh, uh, big time period where he was as popular probably would have been the 40s when he was on the radio, he was on the movies, um, mm. his work was being re reprinted pretty heavily. Um, so yeah, it basically, it's, it's, it's every 50 years, he kind of comes back around again. Absolutely. Um, Simon, how did you, uh, what, what about, what's your story with Sherlock Holmes? Did you get into him quite early on? Um, I think he's just one of those characters that um, he's always sort of been there. Um, I, I don't have like a great affinity for him, but I mean, uh, it's kind of like there's always been those films that come along and you and I've watched them and enjoyed them. But um, yeah, it's, it's not like a, a character I go and sort out. It's a character who's just, he's always there. There's always a new film or a, a TV series or you know, some sort of new reinterpretation and stuff like that. So like recently when we had uh, Sherlock on BBC One and you had the Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes at the cinema, I went out and watched those films. But it's, um, I know, it's, it's just like, it's a character, it's, he's just like been there all the time. It's like Bond, it's like, um, I don't know, Superman, Batman. They're, they're characters who have always sort of been there uh as i sort of grown up and you know into my adult life yeah yeah so they found you in a way um mm, yeah, I, yeah i get it i mean i mean much the same with me really uh my whole thing sort of growing up um i'll, I'll be honest i was probably in terms of the literary works i was probably more more into um uh you know you know batman and bond and, and things <laughs> things of that nature growing mm. up if i if i'm honest um I remember that uh, the, the first sort of Sherlock Holmes that I actually sought out to go and watch, although, um, you, you know, I, I, I now understand that, it, that it's a massive deviation from canon, um, was, uh, was young Sherlock Holmes, or as uh. it was called over here, young Sherlock Holmes in the Pyramid of Fear. Um, oh which, really? I didn't uh, realize that yeah, was the yeah. title in the UK. Yeah, well, we had a longer title because it was based on the success of the Indiana Jones films, you know, like ah. uh, so they tried to make it sound more like that. And uh, it was weird because the, the the reason I went to to see that initially was because it was in that sort of era where Spielberg was sort of putting his names name to things you know he'd done so mm -hmm. with like gremlins and back to the future and whatever and he'd put his name to this even though it was a barry levison film and kind of if, if sherlock put it sorry if spielberg put his name to anything then 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 i'd go and see it basically you know <laughs> yeah i have to i'm thinking about it i think that was the first uh 
time I saw Sherlock on the big screen, I went to see mm-hmm. young Sherlock Holmes. And I think it was just because it was the Spielberg connection and also because it was being pushed towards uh, children at the time. So, yeah. you know, as a as a kid growing up in the 80s, you, you know, you gravitated to those kind of films, those kind of big adventure films. So I think that may have, may have been the first time I sort of saw the character. Yeah, and if yeah. I remember correctly, it was came out around the time of Young Indiana Jones as well, the TV show. Um, so it was definitely the kind of that that you're right that burgeoning growth of the young adult market. Yeah, no, oh, definitely. And I mean, I, I, of course, I realize that you know they 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 completely you, you know shifted the canon by having you, oh, you gotcha. know Sherlock and um, and and Watson meeting it <laughs> at, at high school or whatever, as opposed to or boarding school, whatever it was, as opposed to um, you know meeting much later on, um, as we know from the you know from the canon works but mm-hmm. uh, but i mean obviously you know holmes movies were always on the t- the television you know reruns yeah. and uh, there were um you know television series at that time but i wasn't really so plugged into it i mean like simon said f- for me the uh, the 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 guy ritchie robert downey junior sherlock holmes movie in 2009 kind of um uh, reignited my my interest uh, yep. I- in the character with that film, which obviously I appreciate. It's very much sort of an action film uh, yep. based on those characters, and then of course, almost immediately after, I plugged into the uh, the Sherlock TV series as well, mm-hmm. which uh, you know th- this was this was you know back when Benedict Cumberbatch was was sort of <laughs> barely known in comparison right. to the, the superstar that he is today, you know. Um, and I, and I found that that sort of, uh, you, you know, reimagining, bringing him into the 21st century, but still telling those classic Conan Doyle stories just with mm-hmm. that sort of update and spin. I, I found that very interesting and became, uh, you, you know, ver- very much interested in the character off the back of that, to be honest. And then mm-hmm. then started doing things like, you know, when you live somewhere and you never visit any of the tourist attractions. Right. Well, uh, I actually did get myself down to 221B Baker Street and, uh, you, know, you know, do all of that stuff. And I remember I bought the, um, it came out on DVD, the the definitive Sherlock Holmes Basil Rathbone collection mm-hmm. and, and, and sort of started going back and, and revisiting that stuff. So, um, so yeah, yeah, you, you know, he's always been around. And of course, um, you, you know, I also started watching, although I, I've lost track of it in the last uh, uh, couple of seasons, but I started watching the the elementary uh, TV series as well with with, oh, with yeah. uh, Johnny Lee Miller and uh, um, Lucy Liu. So mm-hmm. uh, y- y- you know, and again, what 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 a deviation from interpretation <laughs> have you got there? But I mean, I, I think that's what keeps it interesting is they 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 have sort of taken the essence of this character and the essence of of um, you, you know what he does as, as as a consulting detective, and 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 sort of you know put it in many different guises over the years. And and we re- recently did a uh, a Roger Moore um, uh, tribute episode, uh, you, you know, after he sadly died. And uh, yeah. I, I I actually hadn't seen Sherlock Holmes in New York, where Roger Moore actually. Oh, played that's him. right. So, uh, I, I you know I I took a look at that as well um, around that time. So yeah, the. the there is a stack out there to see. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean there, uh, that there's um uh, I don't remember where I found it, so I'm not sure how valid this is, but I've heard a couple times that there's not been a year after like the 20s where there wasn't some form of Sherlock Holmes media being produced. Um, basically, right after Conan Doyle died, um, the floodgates kind of opened, and there was always uh, radio shows, television. Um, uh, and it, it's ongoing. I mean, you know, the, uh, one of the the better radio interpretations is actually fairly recent with um, uh, Clive Marison back in the '90s and, and early 2000s. Did it? They did the entire canon. Um, you know, and uh, you know, as you're saying, like in the 2009s, you know, the the it, it's it's become really big in the past eight years. Um, but it's it, part of the reason why I find the character interesting and why I think he endures is because he is one of the few characters where you can radically reinterpret him and still recognize him almost completely. Um, there are very few characters like James Bond's 
pretty close to that because, I mean, if you compare the James Bond interpretations, they're wildly different for each other. You're not know, supposed to be the same guy. They're, you know, they're, they're, which actors playing him gives a very strong interpretation. Doctor Who is another example of a character that can really ex- accept a lot of, uh, of morphology in terms of its interpretation and still recognizably that character. Um, so you're right. I mean, it's uh, uh, while. I mean, Young Sherlock Holmes is such a, a really good example. It's everyone rallies like, oh, it's not canon. It's like, but there's very few of the interpretations of Sherlock Holmes that aren't actually faithful to the canon. The idea of a faithful interpretation of Sherlock Holmes actually didn't really start getting momentum until the ITV series uh, done in the 80s um, uh, with um, the Arsene Granada series uh, in the 80s. Um, I mean that that was the first time I was like, okay, we're doing this as faithfully as possible. Uh, uh, and there's also a Soviet show that was wa- weirdly popular in the USSR uh, that was also extremely faithful. But before then, I was like, let's t- fist and t- 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 uh, turn him around. I mean, um, when the first stage interpretation of Holmes was being put together, uh, the director reached out to Conan Doyle and said, hey, I want to um, have Sherlock Holmes be married. Do you mind? And and Doyle very famously said you can marry him or kill him off for all i care um right. so i mean <laughs> it started it started off even in doyle's lifetime of do what you want you know so i mean the, the, when, you, when you have that kind of uh, of impetus to start of like let's what we can reinterpret and twist it you know so to, you know there are to, to be here now where you have like a, a john lee miller interpretation of sherlock holmes in new york with a female watson it's not that Strange, given the the breadth and 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 length of Sherlock Holmes interpretations over the past 125 years. Yeah. So so you wouldn't consider yourself then? You're not a purist. I mean, you're not one of these people no. that if it does deviate from canon, then then suddenly it's it's not Sherlock. You know? No, it's, I don't. And here's why. Um, it's a bit of a digression, but um, I've always found this very helpful for me. Um, the idea that the word canon that you just used uh, actually comes from a Sherlock Holmes treatise. Uh, it was written in 1921, I believe. Uh, was written by a priest for a Catholic magazine. Um, and he wrote this entire article. Was the first person to coin the concept of a Sherlock Holmes canon, uh, the first person to use canon in terms of connection to media and uh, chronology. Wow. Uh, and, now we use and, it all the time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but what's interesting is that the article he wrote, it, from start to finish, it was basically here's – you know, he, he he dove into very specific small details of the Sherlock Holmes stories and compared them and showed how they don't line up and that therefore his conclusion was – um, we love this stuff in spite of its inconsistent details. The whole thing was meant to be an allegory towards Catholic canon. The, uh, the idea was, yes, the, 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 the things that we study from a religious perspective don't line up, but yet we still have faith in God. And, but he didn't say any of that in the, in the article. But he, he was trying to use Sherlock Holmes as a metaphor for his – stance on his faith so it's always interesting to me that nowadays we have fans you know reenacting these tiny religious wars in their fandoms using terms from this article right, and it all yes. stemmed from sherlockians basically not quite getting the joke from the, <laughs> from the original <laughs> pitch. um yeah, so no I, bizarre, i've always <laughs> yeah I, I i've always argued that when people are like you know oh well this like the the Guy Ritchie film, for example, it's like you know, it's not quite faithful to canon. My arguments to two stands. I'm, I went into this definitely on a, a, a previous podcast, but um, it, it, my, my stance has always been a um, that you're more faithful than you think, and here's all the stuff from the stories you don't know about. But b we live in the same. This movie lives in the same world as the cartoon Sherlock Holmes in the 22nd century. You know? <laughs> yeah, and that yeah. cartoon lasted for for two seasons. So I mean, you know, <laughs> somebody thought that show was good. I own a DVD set. I'm not entirely sure why I own a DVD set, but I do because that show is <laughs> exists and it is a thing that exists. And I, I respect the fact that it exists because, um, you know, it, the fact that we can have two simultaneous interpretation, interpretations of this character in the modern day and they don't feel the same shows how far we can go with this. And, and so I'm, I'm definitely not a person that's like, well, this deviates from this story because. To be perfectly honest, part of the problem is that the, the canon, the original canonical stories themselves, are wildly inconsistent with each other. Um, so, I mean, it's really hard to point to a, a body of work and say, "Well, it's not like that." What's well, like, yeah, but this is also the same body of work that legitimately has monkey glands injected into a person as the big plot point. 
of how he got superpowers. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not exactly super keen on, well, Conan Con- Throw is always right because no, he, uh, he sp- missed, it, missed a few times <laughs> as well as it. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's, it's, if you love the character, whatever gets you into the character, you know, like, like for you guys, it was much later in life you came in. And I, I hear this time and again, I go to Sherlock Holmes conventions or I talk to people online. And they say they started with the Benedict Cumberbatch version. They started with the Jack yeah. Miller version. They started with, um, uh, uh, you know, the movie. And then they've since gone back. And that's one of the reasons why I find Sherlock Holmes fandom so fascinating is because you have people who are, you know, in their seventies, eighties who remember, you know, the, the maybe the original forties and fifties films, um, read the original stories, and they love it for one reason. And then you have, you know, millennials who are just now getting into it. And they love it for different reasons. And these people can get along and have very good, solid, fun conversations about their favorite characters, even though they're approaching the media from completely different standpoints. And that's just, it's a rare fandom that can have that breadth of diversity inside of it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it, it is it is because it's about the character and the mm-hmm. interpretations of that character. And it's not like, like, for example, Star Trek, where it's all trying to fit right. into a certain continuity or a certain timeline or whatever, where, whereas, you know, people get upset about those sort of things whereas with 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 Sherlock you've got so many different interpretations in different times and you, you know even even like they've done with Watson now and the Johnny Lee Miller one where you know we've, we've got a diff- different gender <laughs> character but 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 you know st- still still filling that role and um and, and you know sort of having those traits and 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 working in that story as it were and, and I think the other the other lovely thing about getting into Sherlock Holmes is, is the fact that it opens up so uh, many other doors as well because like I said we went back and watched the Roger Moore version which mm-hmm. was amazing but also um I had never seen the the Peter Cushing um oh, version really? of the Hound of the Baskervilles until quite recently which which I think is amazing you know i really enjoyed that film so uh you know it it is good and that there is so much material to go out there and discover and um and and enjoy and uh you you mentioned earlier the the audio drama um Mm -hmm. i do actually enjoy a good audio drama particularly with with some of the driving and traveling that i do so Mm -hmm. uh, are are those recommended are they yeah um uh uh, the uh i I don't remember who the uh uh, you know, Bert Cool is the producer for them, uh, uh, and Clive Marison plays Holmes. Uh, but they're actually quite good. It is one of the only interpretations of, of Holmes that actually goes through every single story in the original canon and adapts it. So it has the distinction wow. of being the only one that's comprehensive. Um, so, so, but it took them 20 years to get there. They started off like I think it was the early 90s. Uh, the show started off, um, and so you can get the you can get the collections on. Uh, uh, DVD or sorry CD now, um, Audible has a, a large number of them too, um, but they're quite good because uh, they a- attempt to be faithful, but also they recognize that they're playing for a modern radio audience as opposed to the radio audience of like the 40s and 50s, um, and so it tries to use much more kind of modern pacing. Uh, there's a fair bit of rather than Holmes telling you the things he did. Uh, they'll in fact reenact those scenarios. Some of the, the stories that happen in the background that we only find out later, uh, they'll actually intercut that backstory in the with the with the main Holmes and Watson narrative. Uh, so it's a little pacier and it's a little more kind of uh, of upfront. And then now that they've that show's gone through uh, the the original canon, um, they started writing not only their own original. Uh, episodes, but also they've been adapting um, other people's uh, a pastiche of Holmes. Oh wow! Um, okay. So I mean, it it, it it's extremely comprehensive. Um, you, you but it's really hard to kind of because it, it, it's meant to be kind of much like the original stories, pick it up, set it down. There's not really a a, a a character arc or anything that's happening in the stories. So you can just pick up really any collection of them and and find it to be be quite good. All oh, right, they're quite episodic then in their yes. nature rather than yeah, okay. Um, uh, the the uh, when it gets to the novels, um, that those are usually two forty-five minute episodes. Um, so it's it's about now. So that's where it gets episodic. Um, but the other ones are all the short stories, and those are pretty consistently just like one uh, uh, forty-five minute episode kind of knocks the whole story out. I do. Okay, I'll have to check those out. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, 
Well, I mean, for the purpose of our podcast, we 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 asked you what I'm guessing was was a, a fairly difficult question. It um, was. Movie, movie heaven, movie hell. So we we wanted you to pick what your movie heaven for Sherlock Holmes adaptations and your movie hell would be. And of course, there's a hell of a lot of work to go through there. Yes. And I'm sure may, maybe even you haven't seen every adaptation, or no, have you? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> There's no way I could possibly watch all of them. <laughs> Although I have seen the Tom Baker version of Hound of the Basketball Sucks, so that'd be my particular kind of obscure version of the film. Oh, wow. I didn't even realize that. There you go. Yes. Even Tom Baker's done it. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and whatever you're imagining right now is pretty much exactly how the film goes. <laughs> oh, my Lord. It's basically Doctor Who as Sherlock Holmes for the entire movie, and it's glorious and terrible in its own way. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, well, uh, there's, there's there's another one to add to the watch list. My God. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, before we get into your actual picks, is that is there anything, you know, outside of your picks for Heaven and Hell, is is there any particular um, adaptation that 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 you're fond of you know if it's like a series or or, or you know a particular act actor's portrayal or anything that that, that that you want to talk about before we sort of delve into your picks as it were yeah i mean um uh, uh there's kind of two uh, spurs from, from the movie perspective uh, it was particularly hard because like you said there's so many great actors and also they do approach it very very differently um and Young Sherlock Holmes was very close to being on my list, but I really couldn't decide which side it went on, which is ultimately why I cut it. Because in some ways, it's an amazing film, especially for the 80s. It was very high budget, um, had some really fantastic acting moments in it. Um, uh, it, it like, like you guys pointed out, you know, a lot of people from that time period became true Sherlock Holmes. That was very much the Guy Ritchie film of its time in terms of getting people excited about the, the character. Um, but also it is so completely awful in other very different ways. Um, it was, you know, still kind of coming off of the, the, the Basil Rathbone interpretation of the character in some ways. Um, there are some other issues. Uh, uh, some of the special effects did not age well, shall we say, um, and the like. So, I mean, it, uh, there are certain iconic uh, interpretations that are definitely worth noting that that's one of them um uh from a television perspective i have watched uh, you know wildly different opinions on that um but i think the two my two favorite television interpretations uh i, I can't not and confess the jeremy brett version um the the, the granada series is, is almost uh, uh legendary in terms of Perhaps not its complete fidelity to the canon, but it was, like I mentioned earlier, the first series to try to make a strong attempt at fidelity. And his portrayal of Holmes has really shaped how we see the character since then. Um, a lot of actors clearly draw some inspiration in varying degrees from Jeremy Brett. Even the BBC series um, – has strong inspiration and strong draws from that series. Uh, there's there was an obvious uh, uh, episode that, that that show did, which is where Holmes imagined that he was in the Victorian times, and that was, you know, very clearly a a nod to that series. But also little things like the layout of the flat in that from is identical to the layout of the flat in Two Two One B in the Jeremy Brett series. Little things like that. Um, there, there's always been this kind of thread of, of, of homage and uh, respect for that series. So, so you can't not acknowledge that one. But the other one that I personally find satisfying, and most people are surprised by this, is in fact the elementary version. Um, and I think it's because uh, while the BBC Sherlock version is in some ways more uh, uh, directly faithful. Um, it's, it's readapting the original plots in some respects. Um, it, it's, it's referencing the original stories. There's a lot of Easter eggs and inside jokes, if you will, from the original canon. Um, but I feel like Elementary is more true to the spirit of the original stories. Um, I have told a lot of people that there's more sexual chemistry between Holmes and Watson in the BBC version than there is in Elementary. Um, they're just mates. They're, you know, Watson and Holmes are just friends. You know, it's been going on for several seasons now, and that has never changed one iota. Um, the fact that they have a friendship and it feels like a very real, genuine friendship um, uh, is something that you don't see in very many interpretations of the two characters. And in fact, Elementary has done that is is really 
to me, very, very interesting. But also, Doyle wrote these as largely adventure stories. Um, mm -hmm. These were stories that were meant to be uh, uh, throw off entertainment. It'd be, you know, here's a fun little mystery. Um, and sometimes the word mystery is kind of inverted quotes, if you will. Um, it, it's not always that hard of a mystery to figure out. Um, but it really was meant to be kind of this is, you know, just an exciting story. And the police procedural format is a good inheritor of that. Um, you know, you don't watch elementary necessarily to have a gripping, mentally complex mystery because it, it's, it's usually pretty obvious halfway through what's going on or the twist is so out of left field that it doesn't matter whether you think what's going on or not. Um, but in elementary, they, they've – especially after the first season, have more and more used that just as a framework to tell the interesting character drama. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of how the stories, as Doyle wrote them, evolved. They started off as just fun stories, but over time, he recognized that people were interested in, like, you know, he would questions like, what about Sherlock Holmes' family? And then suddenly uh, his brother now appears in the stories, and they start referencing Mycroft. You know, they want to know about Watson's home life, and suddenly they start getting glimpses of uh, his wife and what goes on with his marriage. Um, these are things that weren't at all interesting to other kind of serialized characters that weren't explicitly written as drama. You know, the kind of um, a, a Penny Dreadful prior to that were just either the characters were just frameworks to kind of tell a story or it was such hyperbolic melodrama that it was nothing but characterization. Uh, and this was the first time they had that middle ground. Um, so I feel like Elementary kind of somewhat through design, somewhat through happenstance, really kind of draws into that spirit in a lot of ways that other interpretations either just can't do because of their length uh, or are really more focused on perhaps some different sides of Sherlock Holmes that to me don't don't resonate as well as, as seeing that that, mm -hmm. that kind of you know what do you do when you have to crank out another script because you have to make money and what kind of criticisms do you make from that pressure that's very close to exactly where Doyle was writing from. And so he gave a lot of very kind of that same frisian, but from a modern perspective. Wow. OK, I mean, that's a really interesting perspective on it, because, um, you, you know, I always looked at when when, when sort of elementary was launched, um, mm -hmm. I sort of thought to myself, right, you, you've kind of got. And in, in this time we live in now, sort of three strands of Sherlock Holmes going on. You've got the sort of, you know, big, big budget, high spectacle action mm -hmm. movies with, you know, Robert Downey Jr. in the in the lead. And, you know, you've got those sort of things going on because if memory serves, neither of those films, they, they've both been original stories, just obviously using the... Yes. The, the, the Victorian setting and the, you know, the, 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 the Holmes and Watson characters and, and a lot of the other characters from the canon. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, well, brief digression, but the Game of Shadows second movie does actually Paul draw some set pieces from the fiction um, and a couple of oh, things. the Ryan be, Back Falls thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, um, yes. But, but uh, definitely you're right there that they're generally original stories and the, the conceit is that you can then see when Watson wrote the quote unquote stories after those events, you can see, okay, maybe I see how he interpreted how to have the movie into what this story actually ended up being. So it's kind of a, a backwards engineering of this is the things that Watson actually experienced before he wrote the story. So I, mean, I, I think it's kind of the conceit they were going with, but yes, you're right. Like Otherwise they are original stories. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, f fair enough. So there was sort of that. And then obviously you had the BBC Sherlock series, which right. was, um, you, you know, there were essentially, you know, three TV movies a year, which, right. you know, were were contemporary reimaginings of the the original Conan Doyle, um, you know, stories and works and sort of updated for a modern audience, but still with, you know, somewhat sort of true interpretations of the characters and the character dynamic and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then where I sort of saw elementary fit in was was well, this 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 is you know, this is something quite different in the fact that they, they they've taken the character and the sort of essence of the character, but they, they they've set him on another continent. And then mm -hmm. obviously Watson, they they they've changed the 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 gender, ethnicity, and the entire backstory of the character, but mm -hmm. sort of have have her sort of filling us a, a similar role. Mm -hmm. And you've sort of set set him in this, and they 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 came across as sort of very, as you said, sort of police procedural episodic 
um stories and and of course yes they they they, they brought my croft into it and they sort of merged the characters of of uh, irene adler and and moriarty into mm-hmm. one which again is controversial to some people but you, you know i thought i thought they they handled that quite well but yeah, unfortunately I what what i was finding was that they they were becoming so episodic and because there was sort of 22 23 episodes per season or whatever with the amount of stuff on i i started to kind of lose the thread of it a little bit um yeah. so i i think i actually stopped watching it when they 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 bought um john noble who's an amazing actor i really loved him in fringe yeah but they mm-hmm. they bought him in to play sherlock's father which which yep. my understanding correct me if i'm wrong but that's actually new to the family of of sherlock correct Holmes. It's completely um, invented right yeah and 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 kind of i'm kicking myself now because i think i should have just sort of stuck with it and got into that because i'm probably a a season and a half behind but um but it but it's interesting to to hear you as a as a you know a sort of lifelong uh sherlockian if you like um you, you know have affection for that because i've heard so many people sort of slag the series off because they say oh you know sherlock's you know promis- sexually promiscuous and you, you know he's got tattoos and you know all, all these sort of things that they say is not sherlock so um i i think i think that's quite interesting have yeah, you seen well, that I mean... show simon okay. um uh, not really my parents have watched it but uh it's something that i never really sort of caught i mean i've seen i've seen bits and pieces of it and i get the the gist of it and it, it's very much it, it reminds me very much of a show like monk where each week he's got to solve a new crime and yep. you know and so it's kind of like it was something that didn't really interest me that much because you know it because it, it, it's a you know it's it's a show where it's a lot of episodes and you know it's it, it takes up a lot of time to watch them it's a time commitment back. yeah yeah, for yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. and, and I, I think one of the reasons why i probably get a, a, a stronger affection for it is because until recently actually until i moved to ireland um i was watching it pretty much week to week um and so it's like oh it's 45 minutes a week it's not a big deal and you can see these slow character builds and, and the these elements that 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 move and evolve over time um Game is wrong effects for it, but absolutely. I mean, if I were to binge watch it, it would probably be a slog because it is so much of the, each episode is taken up with this kind of, oh, here's the American crime procedural bit that we have to go through. Um, and, and certainly because it is a popular uh, and very lengthy series, uh, they'll go back to the well, and, and there's definitely some clunkers in there. And sometimes the interesting bits are several episodes separated. Um, and it's all of the detritus that comes from the, uh, the the american style of writing these kinds of shows seems like it sometimes gets in the way but because if you're watching it week to week if you're not trying to binge watch it um the the, the slow to try to take advantage of the fact that this is a slow build um one of the things that is particularly fascinating to me it's less sherlock holmes rated and more on a personal mm-hmm. level um is the fact that he is a recovering addict and that piece of his character never stops being a piece of his character Mm -hmm. um and the fact that over the course of four seasons he's still going to meetings he's still trying to terms with his addiction um because that's how addiction works in real life uh and so you have a case where you now have over 100 over i think 120 episodes now um and he's still as much of an addict in the last episode as he is in the very first one. Um, and the fact that they're just not flinching away from this aspect of his character. He's not magically cured. He's not, they just don't forget about it. it, it it's it's very much a part of, of the dynamic. Um, and it's something that was in the background of the original stories. Um, some people have argued that Doyle never meant for the addiction to be a part of the character, but I've always felt that it was more a uh, uh, prudishness from a sense of Victorian literature rather than actually – he was a physician. He knew the, the ravages that uh, uh, opiate addiction had on his patients, um, and there are certainly bits of the canon where Watson is extremely clear about his stance on it. It's, it's Watson does not do it in any way. Um, There's one of the few times where the two characters actually have uh, an altercation that does not get resolved in Holmes's favor uh, from the canon. Uh, so I mean, this is—it's it's really hard to say that this is not an important part of the character, but yet no other format allows you to go into that in depth because it's either a movie to where that those kinds of things are going to go on the cutting room floor, uh, 
Um, or it's the entire point of the adaptation where you get things like 7% Solution by Nicholas Meyer, where mm -hmm. his diction is the entire part, part of the film, and there's no mystery at all. Um, so this is one of the few times where you can see what is it like to be a functioning private consultant while struggling with this diction, and that by having Watson – by rewriting her character to where uh, it's primarily about she's a contrast to that diction um, – gives them a strong modern dynamic because in, in modern uh, drama, you have to have the kind of polarizing issue that will always draw the characters together and apart. Um, but also that's just how – if you're a friend with an attic, that's the kind of stuff you go through. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, I mean, it, it it's – to me, it is – if you look at it for – Sherlock Holmes doesn't do this checklist of things, and you're right. Elementary is not a great adaptation. If you're looking at it for, I want every frame to be exciting and interesting, and about Sherlock Holmes is a terrible adaptation for that. For if you take the core of what the character is and then use modern writing to re-examine those core elements, it's actually quite good um, from that perspective. Uh, uh, but again, it's one of those things where it's like it, it's it's written for network television. It's not written for the Netflix novel. It's not written for uh, the DVD model. Um, and so sometimes it feels a bit sluggish from modern perspectives because it's trying to do different things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it it's but I mean the same can be said for any interpretation of Holmes, the original stories, the movies. Um, if you're watching Young Sherlock Holmes with the idea of this is going to be a faithful interpretation of the character, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But like like you guys pointed out, if you look at it from the mold, uh, this was the Indiana Jones pulp adventure interpretation of Sherlock Holmes. It nails it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm glad I'm glad Elementary's going strong and still going well because obviously there was a lot of controversy around oh, yeah. when it first came out simply because obviously um, you know Benedict Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller had been doing sort of interchangeable roles on stage in, in the in the Frankenstein. Um, uh, play directed by Danny Boyle, yeah, which was right. which was amazing, by the way. But um, you, you, you know, and and a lot of people just thought it was a a, a bit of a cheap gag and all this sort of thing. But um, uh, you know, I, I think Johnny Johnny Lee Miller's a really good actor, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, his to me his interpretation of Sherlock is different enough from uh, what Benedict Cumberbatch is doing wonderfully well. You know, in in in, in the BBC show to to, to mm -hmm. make them. You, you know their their own stand stand up in their own right if you like and i th i think yeah there's definitely room out there for both of them so w why not you know yeah. <laughs> um cool. i just one thing i wanted to bring up uh which has been kind of interesting about the um with sherlock holmes is the adaptations where they take it uh, take it upon themselves to you know make sherlock holmes maybe not the main character or mm -hmm. so the lights of without a clue or mm -hmm. um I, I don't believe i couldn't just found out that uh peter cook and dudley moore did like their own version of hound of the baskervilles which <laughs> it's like that's that's like a little blow my mind a bit i yeah i love to see that because i can imagine it's quite funny or quite awful but um <laughs> probably a little bit of both yeah yeah um <laughs> But I mean, this 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 whole um, you know the the fact that they, they you can you can take it and make it look like you know that uh, that the main character was not what he's made out to be. I always find kind of interesting. What do you, um, what do you guys think about that? I would say is that there's actually a, a long tradition of it, and now I'm going to really dig into the obscurities of Sherlockania. Um, but uh, back in the 60s, um, there was a writer named uh, Robert L. Fish who wrote a bunch of stories for Ellery Queen's mystery magazine, um, and he called them the Schlock Holmes stories. Uh, and they were very much in that same vein of Sherlock Holmes came to extremely rudimentary, obvious deductions or completely the wrong Thing that the, the reader knows this is the wrong thing. And they were written, they were meant to be parodies in much the same way you're talking about. Mm. Um, and so Watson becomes kind of the, the, the long suffering friend who tries to point out to his increasingly idiotic friends, you know, this is what's wrong. But there was that a strong uh, parodic tradition of Sherlock Holmes from the late 50s all the way through the 70s, which I think both of those films kind of were also uh, a place. There, there's been rumors of another modern day one that's happening. Um, I think they got cans though. 
Uh, but there was another one that was a bit like without a clue in terms of, you know, Sherlock Holmes is an idiot. Um, I don't remember what happened with that one. It was done by an American film company, which is always a, a suspicious start. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, there, there, there's, where there's actually this kind of, uh, uh, there, there are friends of mine who are specifically Sherlockians just studying these parody versions of him. And, and so like, there are some that go back even further, but they're much more kind of isolated. Um, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, I'm sorry, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, cousin, I want to say, uh, wrote the very first parody Sherlock Holmes story in like the 1890s, uh, and it was specifically just to to, to, to fuck with his his, his relative. <laughs> uh, it, it was published the whole nine yards, and then Arthur finds it, and you know, and they wouldn't speak for like years after that as a result. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and then uh, in um, in France, uh, the um, uh, Arsène Lupin stories uh, originally had a character named Herlock Sholmes, uh, and and he and Arthur, you know, got his lawyers and, and solicitors to kind of, you know, yell at the French, and then and, and so in, for for many years that character was rewritten and replaced with a completely different character that was. Obviously, Sherlock Holmes had a different name, and it's only been recently that they started to reprint uh, English translations of uh, the Arsene Lupin stories with Herlock Sholmes put back in um, <laughs> because now the argument – and this is hilarious. The argument is that Herlock Sholmes is a unique character in its own right from a legal perspective and therefore should be reinstated. <laughs> so there's this, there's, there's this Sorry. weird kind of, of – circle that happens now with with the parodic interpretations of Sherlock Holmes where they're starting to become their own little mini literary and media movements interpretation of the character. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It shows what a powerful <laughs> character it is to have that many interpretations. Exactly. Uh, and I would be right in saying that Hound of the Baskervilles is the most adapted uh, st yes. story. Yes. For reasons that baffle me, actually, I'm like, it's not yeah. entirely baffling. Um, it's it, it's 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 just really a good story, but also it is a story that has the least amount of Sherlock Holmes in it, which is why it's always weird. Yeah, it also it also, in my opinion, didn't quite work with the uh, with the with the Sherlock TV, you know, reimaginings. Right. That 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 for me was one of the weaker of the adaptations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know that's just me, but I. I yeah, I didn't think that one was was quite up there with 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 some of the other stuff. And I think it's I think it's a tough it's a tough um, it's a tough story to try and uh, you, you know adapt into a sort of contemporary time where it's it's all supposed to be realistic and and, and make total sense. Um, right. I, I think that's a bit of a tricky one to to, to adapt because it's 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 uh, you know it, it, it's it's slightly more. Um, you know, far fetched than some of the other stories. Yeah, it's it, it's it's definitely stemming from the the gothic tradition of the time in, in the, the the very original sense of it's meant to be heightened, uh, supernatural. Um, and of course, the idea is that then the whole all this gothic atmosphere gets completely demolished uh, by Holmes in the last pages of the book. And that was kind of the point that, that Doyle was going for. Is like I want to tell a great gothic story, and then I'll put in a bit at the end where Holmes says it's all bunk, but. Really, he's wanting to tell a good ghost story, and that's – so you have – in order to do that convincingly, you have to get Holmes out of the plot for most of it. So he doesn't immediately go, well, that's obviously a for Peyton. You're all stupid. Um, so you have to have Watson doing the lion's share of the plot movement in that book. So it's always interesting when like, another interpretation of how the Baskets comes, it's like how much percentage of Holmes is added back into the scripts so that people recognize this Sherlock Holmes film, even though the original story had very little Sherlock Holmes in it. And then how do you address the problem of Sherlock Holmes not immediately recognizing that this is not a supernatural problem? Right. Yeah. It's an interesting one. It is. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I suppose we better, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a big character with so many adaptations over the years and all the different medium um, mm. that uh, we, you know, we, we literally, well, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is a, a, a podcast out there dedicated purely to Sherlock Holmes. There are probably dozens of them. Oh, there um, are. But uh, I guess to, to move this along, then we'd better, we'd better uh, have a look at your picks and, and have a little chat about those. So uh, do you want to tell us what your pick first off for, for movie heaven is, please? 
Absolutely. Um, my pick for movie heaven was uh, Mr. Holmes. Uh, it's actually an extremely recent film. It's only two years old, uh, and it stars uh, Ian McKellen as Holmes. And also, uh, while there is a mystery here, uh, um, it's definitely not the focus of the movie. Um, some people have uh, had some controversial opinions about it, but to kind of give context, um, it was based off of a novel called A Slight Trick of the Mind. Which is a fantastic novel. Is it's definitely a case where the film is good, the novel's a little better, but only because so much of the story is about Holmes's mental state. The idea is this is long after his retirement, um, and he's starting to develop uh, mental problems. He, he, he's extremely old. He's in his, I believe, eighties. The film says. I think he's. I think he's ninety three. Yeah, he's supposed okay. to be in that film or whatever. Okay. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. He's extremely old, uh, and uh, his memory is going. Old for um, 1947, not old for today, obviously. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, for, for the medical of the time. Uh, and also specifically uh, um, uh, and very intentionally, the film is positioned right after World War II. Uh, uh, and and that be, uh, that's a big portion of, of, of kind of the tension of the film. Uh, but more specific to me is that um, uh, I find it interesting because this is – one of those rare exceptions where I just talked about how it's really hard to get into a character arc with with Holmes, but also to go into the mystery. And this is one of the few that actually does manage to accomplish both. Um, uh, it is very much in the vein of the Nicholas Meyer idea of let's look at Holmes specifically as a character, not as a, a context for telling mysteries. Um, so Seven Cent Solution and other Nicholas Meyer uh, uh, novels originally kind of came from this idea of let's actually treat him as a literary character. Um, and, and this – movie definitely comes from the same idea of we're really primarily looking at Holmes. This is also Holmes who has survived, out, outlived his entire supporting cast. Uh, so so Watson is gone. His brother is gone. Every other person in his life uh, is dead. He's the last remaining member, and he's extremely alone. Um, and so he gravitates to this, this, this young uh, child uh, who is quite as observant as he is. Um, and, and part of the, the tension of the film is he's trying to remember why he retired. Uh, he knew he, he retired very suddenly, um, and he knew there had to be a reason, but now because of his memory problems, he doesn't quite recall exactly why. So he's trying to write down the details of his last case. Um, uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on. It is paced very much like uh, a, a, a drama, a character drama. So I mean, it is slower paced than, like, say, a Guy Ritchie film, um, and that's intentional. Uh, but one of the things that I really loved about the film is that um, Holmes it, it talks a lot about Holmes in a post popularity environment. Um, there's always a conceit in short stories is that uh, Watson is publishing them uh, after the cases that he was a part of, and so they're meant to be memoirs. Um, and because of how long the stories were written for. It ran to the point eventually where Holmes would have been logically active at the time that the stories were being published. And Doyle touched on it a couple times, but didn't really dig into the details of what that meant. And so this movie goes into things like the fact that Holmes does not actually live at 221B Baker Street because that would be really dumb to publish your address when people want to kill you on a regular basis. Um, but also – and there's one great moment where he goes to see a Basil Rathbone film. And to watch himself on the screen. And in a particularly juicy meta joke, the person playing Basil Rathbone is the same actor who played young Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> yeah. So it's 25 years after that actor was playing the, the, the young adult version of himself, now, now playing the, the Basil Rathbone version of Sherlock Holmes in the black and white era. And then you have Ian McKellen watching him. Uh, and it just and, – and, and the, the disdain and, and annoyance he has that this is the view that people have of him because of Watson's efforts. And they talk a lot about how um, that ultimately soured – there are a couple other instances of film, but ultimately how that soured their relationship. Um, but throughout all of it, you have uh, uh, Holmes who's much, much older, who has mental faculties are diminished, um, who's emotionally broken down. And yet he never stops being himself. Uh, um, he's these flashes of pure observation and and uh, concision uh, that you can see. This was the character that we all recognize. 
Um, and he always, these, these kind of pop up in a way that is very believable interpretation of a man who was very brilliant and is still in his own way very brilliant, but also is not what he was. And Ian McCullen does a fantastic job of, through his portrayal and his uh, acting and his posture, showing the frustration that Sherlock has because this is the one – this is literally the one thing he is known for. This is the one thing he spent his entire life honing was his intellect, and now it's being taken from him. And it's so heartbreaking to to watch that, and ultimately it ends on a positive note because <clears throat> that's kind of how these films are paced and structured. Um, but it, it's, it, it, it talks very um, uh, very strongly about what happens when you're left alone, what happens when um, you build your entire life around being a person who doesn't need people, and then all the people that were in your life are gone. Um, th it's like he liked to play at being alone. He was not actually alone until he was really alone, and even then he had a housekeeper, and the housekeeper had a son, and so it's like he was still always around people. There's a lot of – Things this this movie is doing, as well as on top of that, addressing small inconsistencies in the canon, on top of that, addressing uh, the complex relationship between Britain and Japan after World War II. There's just so much going on in this film, and it never feels like it's – there's a couple times where it kind of drops the ball a little bit, but it always feels like it's always done through the lens of, of Holmes, and you're always drawn in through that character portrayal. Um, it, it, it's definitely a film I point to people. It's like if you want to know about Holmes the character, if you don't want to just have a great mystery film, because there are other films that are really great at that. Um, and in fact, I would say if you want just a film that's about the classic Sherlock Holmes dynamic, probably the Guy Ritchie film is a better one to look to. Um, but in terms of Holmes as a character, in terms of why this character has endured for so long and why people are still in love with this man 125 years later, definitely uh, Mr. Holmes is the best film to kind of show that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think you've summed that up really well, actually. Um, uh, I, I think this is a fabulous film. Uh, I saw it when it came out. I was, in fact, I was lucky enough to go and see it at a screening where um, uh, Siri McKellen actually did a Q and A afterwards. Oh which my was, god, was amazing! I... So it was like it was like a masterclass. It was it oh, was incredible. Wow. But 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 what what struck me about it was I thought that um, you know we we've got the the are at the moment you know this, this landed what 2015 right yeah. in the sort of time of the hot this sort of peak that we're having at the moment of, mm -hmm. of, of of Sherlock in terms of uh modern day popular popularity in in the culture and whatever um but it's interesting because because you know all these other versions whether they're um Guy Ritchie's or Sherlock's BBC Sherlock or Elementary you know that they're, they're all dealing with a a, a fairly young Sherlock, you know, a right. Sherlock in his 30s or 40s, you know, sort of in, in, the, in the sort of height of his career, as it were. Um, and I just think, yeah, you know, dealing with him much later in his life, um, you, you know, was a really interesting uh, prism through which to see this for once. And like you said, without the, you know, dealing with that issue of, you know, Sherlock's, a, you know, a total sociopath and, and, and mm -hmm. you know, not doesn't have good people skills whatsoever. And, you know, sort of likes to think of himself as completely self-sufficient. Yet, you know, he's always in all of the stories had this massive support network of, mm -hmm. of other characters and family, etc. around him. And to sort of strip that away and to deal with the sort of dementia um of the character i mean I, I you know during it as well um and, and it is it's beautifully made it's beautifully acted um you know he's got great supporting car you've got laura linney in this who's who's mm -hmm. you know fantastic actress as well and um yeah i couldn't agree with you more i, I could completely understand why you picked this as, as as movie heaven even though it's not what people would typically think of as a Sherlock Holmes film, because obviously it's not him on an adventure, you, you, you know, solving a, solving cases and stuff. It's more of, a, like you said, it's more of an internal thing of him solving his, his own humanity, as it were. And uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a fabulous film. So and, and, and it's, it, it's, it's, <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. Uh, there's um, uh, the, the, 
uh, what we say, post-retirement homes uh, is kind of an interesting character for a number of reasons. One of them is, is strangely relates to copyright um, because until extremely recently, actually right around the time this phone came out, um, uh, uh, the copyright for homes after retirement was still held by the Conan Doyle estate, but the character prior ah. to that was considered public domain. Um, and so the ruling for a long time was that uh, the according to those, I tried to say that therefore the entire character was in copyright. That was their argument. Was since this one piece of it is in copyright, therefore the whole character is in copyright. It was ruled then that there's this line where you know if you want to, if you want to and show the character post retirement, you do have to get the consent of the state. But the character prior to that is now open to public domain. It was that ruling was in the U.S. and I believe the U.K. court upheld that. Um, I have to double check that bit. I didn't know that. I always assumed it was completely public domain. So that's interesting. That's, right, which uh, is why you don't see a lot of interpretations of him in this time period. That's one of the reasons why Mr. Holmes is particularly striking, and also one of the reasons why I think it failed in the theaters is because people came in with a very different expectation. You see a film called Mr. Holmes, you're expecting to see a certain kind of movie, and this movie is not that. Yeah, um, but I think well, it's this, why. It, well, this it, is the problem. They've sort of turned him into an action hero in right. in the other films, haven't Correct. they? Which, which, let's be honest, uh, you know, you know, that's that's not really what what he is and uh, well it's like i said when, when i grew up I, you know I, I admitted it at the beginning i was more drawn to you know batman and james bond as fictional characters even though you know one could argue that they have a few in terms of the detective side of things you know a few similarities in there mm -hmm. but but you know but they were very much men of action rather right. than men of intellect and uh, it's interesting with the robert downey jr films they kind of have made him a man of action as well and 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 you're absolutely right you know th th this this is this is purely a drama and a very good one yeah. but y you're right if people who are sort of fans of of, of, of that franchise then come in to see oh let's see a film about him being older and and, and having it being you, you know a much more sort of emotional inward type film then then yeah I, I guess it would be i mean was it a failure I, I know it was i know it was critically a success was was right. it a commercial failure I'm it was a commercial sure. failure yeah oh was it oh it's yeah. a real shame it's a real it shame is. um but i mean well the one thing i find uh, great about the film as a result is because it, first of all it, it feels very fresh because like i mentioned it's not an area that a lot of people explore the only other writer who really does work in this area is uh, uh laura king uh laura king with her beekeeper apprentice series um where she has a new character that is holmes's assistant and so she he's training her and you have almost a kind of the to use your analogy the batman beyond dynamic of the older bruce wayne trying to teach the younger new batman uh what way of the world um but the other piece that i like is that if you put say the robert downey jr film next to mr holmes um you kind of get this implicit character arc of this interpretation of Holmes as a sociopath, as someone I don't need people, you know, I, I want to live inside my own head. When you're younger and smart, that's an understandable reaction. And as you get older, you realize I can't live like that. Um, and so now you have this kind of almost a critique of that action hero Holmes that emerges is the sense that if you, if you look at in, in the context of other Sherlock Holmes interpretations, now it's the well, that, that, that action hero character, of course he was that way because he was a young, foolish man, and now that Holmes is wiser, he kind of regrets some of those decisions. Even though there's never a specific case outside of the ones presented in the film, um, you, you kind of get the, the implicit uh, uh, a criticism of Holmes as superhero through this film. Um, and I think that that doesn't diminish or invalidate those other interpretations, but rather it does show we can do more with this character. This character is not yeah. just a superhero interpretation. Yeah, it so, almost fleshes it out, doesn't it? It fleshes right. the character out even more so. Um, and, and I hadn't considered until you said it in your, um, your sort of uh, summary of the film there. Um, I hadn't thought of that, but yes, it does indeed also sort of explain inconsistencies in the canon uh, mm -hmm. uh, as well and this film does address that which uh which which yeah that, that's actually pretty clever because it's it's quite subtle in the way that it does so but um mm -hmm. yeah yeah you, you you can you can see why uh you, you know well by his irritation of how you, you know the the popular culture in inverted commas remembered mm -hmm. him <laughs> it's yeah it's it, yeah interesting Right, and also, I mean, you know, it, it addresses little things that happen in the real world, like the fact that um, 
uh, Sherlock Holmes was so popular that he was translated into a wide variety of languages, including Japanese. Um, and so the idea of Holmes going to Japan and meeting someone who has a copy of Sherlock Holmes in Japanese um, is a thing that could have happened had he really existed. So there's this, again, um, between little bits like that and also the more obvious kind of things of him seeing a Basil Rathbone film, uh, you have this great exploration of what if the man really existed and had mm -hmm. to live through our popular culture interpretation of him? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's the thing. This, this film treats it. And this is what I think the filmmakers did that was very clever with this is, of course, we all know, you know, it's a fictional character, mm -hmm. but they almost treat this film like a biopic. Yes. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's almost, it, it even has that sort of um, feel to it. When, when you go and watch, you know, movies nowadays that are biopics about characters that lived at a certain time and whatever, um, you, you know, the, the, the way this film was set up, um, it has almost that same feeling to it. So, uh, um, you, you, you know, it was quite interesting that they did that. And of course, casting a, a wonderful actor like Sir Ian McKellen was great because, you know, he's sort of, he, he his actual age is sort of in between the two ages that he plays right. in, in the film. So, you know, with the prosthetics and everything, they, 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 they made him up to be in his 90s. But then obviously you had the stuff that was taking place um 30 years earlier as well um mm. and, and and it kind of worked didn't it i thought it was uh yeah, absolutely. You, you know it, it, it was quite have you seen this one simon i have and funny enough i was gonna ask you guys if you had seen it and uh i thankfully i sort of I'm glad I didn't ask you that question because uh... <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awkward. Yes. <laughs> uh, what are you going to talk about? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, I caught this uh, on Amazon Prime and uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it's um, as you say, it's such a different take on the character. And uh, you know, I, I'm sort of I'm a fan of Bill Condon's work. Um, having first film of his I saw, which funny enough was a biopic, uh, which was uh, of Gods and Monsters, which ah, right, also yes. had Ian McKellen in it. So yeah. um, it was it was good to see those two uh, working together again. And such a, an, you know, thought provoking story. And yeah, I sort of really enjoyed it. But it is, um, that that's, is one of the things about Bill Condon's work is that it's, um, I would say it's kind of small scale, not TV like, but uh, it's not the kind of work that's going to draw in a big audience. So it's it's intimate. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly a film that's uh, uh, more suited for you know uh, home viewing, and uh, I think it works very successfully there. So it's um, it was yeah, it was great to see that film and um, yeah, sort of you know kind of once in a while go back and think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's had, it's had plenty of accolades um, in terms of critically and whatever, but uh, I hadn't I hadn't really sort of I'm terrible with this. I don't sort of always pay attention to the sort of uh, commercials in the box office on something. But um, but but you, I, I agree with what you're saying there, Simon. I think this this could, you know, even if it didn't do very well in the theatres, this could definitely, um, y y you know, do very well on an, on another platform. Um for sure. Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, think, it, yeah. It, 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 not to sort of, um, you know, put it down or anything, but it's a kind of film that you can watch on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Which is actually no, when I watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I think I think the reason, I mean, it, it's critical failure, but again, it's kind of inverted commas, because I think what happened was a lot of people involved in the production of it thought, Sherlock Holmes is hot right now. Mm. Let's do this, let's do this novel, and like I said, give it kind of the biopic feel, but ultimately it'll make Guy Ritchie numbers. It's like, no, this film was never going to make Guy Ritchie numbers, it, it, and it, it came out in uh, the winter, um, which yes. is another kind of strike against it. Um, uh, I mean, so I think it was uh, – even the people kind of marketing and, and positioning the film didn't quite understand what they had in their hands, um, but I think if it had been – Dealt with more like it, like it is, like you said, like a biopic, like a, a maybe even a non-fictional film, um, and then market it that way, position that way, and the expectations were that way. I think it would have been much more successful. But I think it was again we're in the kind of the the the, the conflict of what the popular culture sees the character as and what the character can be, um, and this was just not lining up. I'm actually 
pleasantly surprised that so much of the creative vision of both the novel and the director were able to actually kind of stay the course in this because it's definitely a film that could have been ruined mm. by executive meddling very, very easily. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. And I was yeah. glad to see that that did not happen. Um, but again, is it kind of uh, – uh, it, it's really hard sometimes to divorce – what the character actually is, what this interpretation of the character is doing, and what people think the character either is or should be doing. And this is one of those things where it's like, again, I love this film, but it is kind of a casualty of, of the conflict between those. And so it's also bittersweet. It's like, it's such a great film, and also everyone hates it. Same with Elementary. It's like, you know, it's like mm. everyone kind of goes down on it, but it's like, it's, it's actually doing some really cool stuff if you look at it from this other perspective. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of a bittersweet film in itself, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say Elementary must be doing something right because it's been continued on for so many series now. So, you yeah, you know, TV channels don't uh, renew uh, shows unless they're bringing in numbers. So, oh, big time! Yeah, net networks will cancel anything if it's not bringing in a number. And uh, yeah, so the fact well, that actually... we're up to the fifth season now, are we? Is it the fifth yeah. season? Um, I, I mean... uh... I, I, I had the the privilege of a friend of a friend knows someone who's one of the writers on the show. So basically, it was the I, my friend got me into a conversation with with one of the writers in the show. Um, uh, it was kind of a casual conversation, unrelated to Elementary. But uh, one of the things that he mentioned, kind of in context, was that CBS had been looking for years for a new CSI. They realized the CSI brand was not bringing the monies that they wanted it to, um, and so that's why you had this kind of past six or seven years. This this run of all of these different similar flavored shows and so it was one of the things elementary on paper was okay let's take Sherlock Holmes plus CSI done call you know let's get it out there and see if it does anything um and kind of in spite of itself it's done really well because and, and really I think CBS is going to start leaning on elementary as kind of it's another next big long-running show so I mean uh you're right it, 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 it's making CBS money which makes them happy um and so therefore it's doing some stuff well but I mean again it's it's the uh, what you think Sherlock Holmes should be doing and what elementary is doing are, are sometimes at odds. And sometimes it's in interesting ways. Like you said, with uh, the conflation of uh, uh, Irene Adler and Moriarty, it's like that became, uh, uh, whoa, whoa. I mean, no one saw that coming and it was actually really interesting and exciting. And the other times it, it, it's like, you know, you know, why is Sherlock Holmes having sex with all these people? And, you know, that, that, that kind of strikes at odds and take, and the show has to then basically go through and explain actually justify that creative decision through you know the rest of the episodes yeah well um, i mean they, they, they've done their typical sort of network let's try and tick all the boxes like like for example right. correct me if i'm wrong but um is it isn't miss hudson on this one a transgender character yes. is that correct yeah yes which, yes which, you know great but uh you, you, you know it does almost feel sometimes like like the network's try and tick boxes with, with these things, you, you know. And, right. I, uh, mean, I mean, I was happy to see a transgender character on the show. It's like, oh, wow, a transgender character on network television. That's really great. But also she shows up like once a season. That's um, right. So it's like, so it, it, yeah, it, it does feel she more like it. Almost... She comes and cleans the flat once, once a season, like you right. said. And then, and, then, and then goes, she comes to the brownstone, gives it a clean and then leaves again. It's like, oh, yeah. OK. But, You're uh, the worst housekeeper ever, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But um, but I I really must pick up with it again then because I, I really like the actor John Noble and this sort of new yeah. idea about um, you know bringing uh, Sherlock's father into the mix, particularly as you you know the, with the premise of the show um, and Watson being sort of meeting him as a, as his sober companion initially. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but but she was actually hired by his father. That's right yeah, to do that. So. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think that could be quite an interesting, uh, interesting angle to follow. Do, do they do they make a lot of character arc in it, or is it still yeah. very episodic? Have you no, got a lot um, of mythology episodes as well thrown I, in there. I, I, I will say, I mean, uh, it, it's episodic in the sense of the mysteries are episodic. The actual character arcs are constantly ongoing. So, I mean, that, there's stuff in that season that's referencing the first season, second season. So, I mean, uh, and the characters are constantly. All the movies. So I mean, so from from character perspective, it definitely is continuing to move. Um, but one thing uh, uh, I think is important, to kind of bring it back to to Mr. Holmes, is that um, Elementary and to a certain degree, BBC Sherlock both took very strong kind of creative breaks from the characters 
and then they had to kind of try to get like I said justify within the fiction why they were doing that. Um, like Mary Watson is a good example in BBC Sherlock. It's like she's very different from original character, and then they, they have this entire episode basically is this is why Mary Watson is this way. Um, Mr. Holmes does the same things, but doesn't waste a ton of time justifying itself. And I think the movie's stronger as a result. Um, right. Even though, like I said earlier, I think audiences maybe kind of weren't unsure what they were getting into. The film is kind of unapologetic. They're going, nope, you're getting seen out Sherlock Holmes, and that's what you're watching for the next two hours. And it just gets on with it. And I think that it's, it's to the movie's credit that it does that because so many past issues do try to kind of – Okay, let's like, explain to the hardcore fans why we're doing this thing. And Mr. Holmes is like, nah, this is just Surya McCallan being amazing for two hours, and you're going to love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we all did. So that's yeah. good. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so good one, good one for movie heaven. Yeah. Brilliant. Before um, we move on, Keith, though, <laughs> yeah. I just want to ask you what would you have been your pick for movie heaven? Quickly. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> oh, I haven't even thought about that. I'll, I'll be, be back honest. in two hours. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. You you obviously have something on the tip of your tongue that yes. you're going to suggest. Yeah, uh, go I'm going to. I loved this when I was a kid, and um, it's a TV show called The Baker Street Boys. And All right. I have not seen that one. It was, oh, well, good luck finding it because it's from 1983. It was a BBC One um, children's show. And it was um, it was um, following like a, they, the, um, what they call the Baker Street. Um, Irregulars. Irregulars, yes. But in this, right. in this, they were called the Baker Street Boys. And they were kind of like a gang of street urchins who um, I believe in one of the episodes had to... Uh, they were solving their own crimes as well as sh helping Sherlock Holmes. And I think there was an episode where they had to find Sherlock Holmes. He'd gone missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just... interesting. Yeah. And I, just, I remember seeing that as a kid. That was... Um, it was on the children's BBC. It was... Um, they did like one season of it. And, uh, you know, it was, I think it's just sort of talking about Sherlock Holmes and all the different iterations it just kind of you know came back to me that show and so i thought you know that's something that was a lot different um film wise um i've always enjoyed michael caine's sherlock holmes in without a clue oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no i said that, that's yeah. interesting i mean it, it does bring up the point as well of of you, you know we obviously think everything is available mm. but it's it's amazing how much um stuff out there how much material still is not available um mm -hmm. I, I can name a sherlock holmes example actually um we had we were lucky enough to have as a guest on one of our episodes um the american film producer kenneth johnson mm -hmm. and um uh he had done an adaptation of sherlock holmes in the 90s which the conceit of that one was um the character of sherlock holmes uh, in the victorian times uh, gets gets frozen and is reawakened yes. in what was then contemporary era, uh -huh. and um, uh, that you know I've I've asked Kenneth about that because I want and he said sadly it is not available. Uh, no. It's owned, you know, he doesn't own it. It's owned by I think it is CBS actually yep. owned a lot of the uh, Sherlock television rights, and um, it's not been released on DVD or Blu-ray or, or anything. It's it, on demand. It's just not available to see at all. And, uh, you know, that's a real shame because, um, you, you know, something like that now, if they, if they repackage that up now, that could probably sell because, you know, people are into Sherlock Holmes. So, you know, what's, you know, what's, why, more, interesting? You know what's more interesting about interpretation? That actually is the first time that Watson was a woman. Oh, there you go. Yes. In fact, I think that's how we got talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, indeed. Yeah. Because they're obviously making, making out that the, uh, you know the elementary that's the big the big oh you know this has not been done before and you're right she is yep. in that a woman right mm -hmm. yes yeah like yeah. there's one thing i've heard about it's almost like it's like it's like it's like bigfoot sighting so shock is going oh have you heard about the show it's like yeah i remember here's a snippet from the tv guy and like trying to reconstruct the show because you're right no one can find it cause it's, it's just not available yeah no it's a shame it's a shame because i'd like to see that and uh y y you know um, but there you go. But in terms of what my heaven pick would be, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you right now. Um, I really couldn't. Uh, so uh, I'd need to think about that one. I, I will say yeah. um, what was very nearly my heaven pick was The Great Mouse Detective. 
<laughs> okay that's that's a film i do remember coming out and i've seen it a couple of times on tv but i can never remember it, it just never sticks with me right yeah and that, that's that's also why I, I i didn't is because i mean as a film it's 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 a decent animated film of that time period of disney's production mm. um it came out like that was when like their the like, last burst of the hand cell animations uh, era um, and so, like from a from an animation perspective, it's really interesting, and it has some really great, beautiful moments. I love Toby as the dog in there, um, and as a Sherlock, as a kind of almost parody of the um, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce uh, dynamic, it's it's actually genuinely funny. Um, but as a film and as a story, it's kind of like, wait, what just happens? There was a a mouse, and he was angry, and then there's a dog, and now we're here. Um, so I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's actually objectively kind of only an okay film, but there's lots of you know if, if you grew up the right time period watching it, I know a lot of my friends were Sherlockians are kind of like it's like the guilty pleasure of like oh yeah I'm great mouse detective too. It's like yeah, that's also a Sherlock Holmes film technically speaking. It, mm. it's, it's okay, you can like that too. <laughs> You're allowed. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so. This brings us on then. What would be your, or what is your pick? Sorry, not would, what would be, but what is your pick for um, uh, movie hell? This, I have gotten so many fights about this okay. um, online. Uh, my, my pick for movie hell is Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon. It is, in fact, one of the Basil Rathbone films. And um, a, this film, in context, is slightly interesting. It is one of the uh, uh, swath of films um, that they did. So, I have, actually, I have to step back a little bit. Actually, but before you before yeah. you get into that, let me just <laughs> just just because I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Okay. First off, obviously, the Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce um, series of of, of of Holmes and Watson. Um, those were very popular movies. Uh, you, you, you know, throughout the the, the the late 30s into the 40s right and um uh i'll definitely remember seeing some of these on on television and as i said the definitive collection came out which mm -hmm. were all restored by uh, ucla they went through a whole restoration yep. thing on them which are nicely done but correct me if i'm wrong the the, the first two of those films were indeed um, set in Victorian England, but yes. from there on, they cut because again, you, you know, everybody says, "Oh, what Sherlock's done is so so groundbreaking by you know taking Holmes and Watson and putting them in in the twenty first, you know, putting them in contemporary times." But isn't that sort of what they did with the Basil Rathbone series? In so much as they set them when they were made, so they were made during sort of World War Two in 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 the in the forties. Is, that's, is that that's, right? That's exactly and that's what I was going was going to say. Um, so right. you, you definitely hit them on the head. What happened was um, the first two films uh, were done uh, by one film studio, uh, and then they let the rights lapse, uh, and so a, a rival studio bought both Nigel Bruce and uh, uh, Basil Rathbone's contracts so they could do other Sherlock Holmes. But their first studio had the visual rights to Holmes in the classic costume. Oh, I, I thought it was down to a budgetary thing. I didn't realize it was Some of it was budgetary thing. too. Some of it was budgetary too, but also right. um, uh, uh, because what, what happened was also uh, the original two films were done during the, uh, the, the A movie uh, uh, film studios. Um, so they were higher budgets, uh, they were made less frequently, and to save costs, they actually moved uh, uh, the, the second studio, I think it's Universal, got the rights, um, moved them to the B movie production line, which is where a lot of the, the noir films ended up coming from, but also is it cheap, faster, this is the pre-television, let's just get consumable media out there so people are coming back to the theaters every week style right. of the film um, because they found the Sherlock Holmes films were popular. But the choice to move them budgetarily was because they could not get the right – there were some rights problems with keeping him in Victorian England, specifically to have um, uh, uh, Basil Rathbone in the Deerstalker hat with the pipe. Right, so 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 he traded the deer stalker for uh, a fedora, fedora, basically. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But 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 it just goes to show you that they had contemporized Sherlock yes. Holmes long before, you know, two thousand and ten or whatever it was. <laughs> right, and, and, and this this was um, the the first time 
uh, popularly that happened. There's some research that shows that maybe there have been some uh, 20s and 30s reinterpretations of poems uh, literature. Uh, but in terms of popular culture, uh, this is the first reinterpretation uh, of Holmes as a, as a modern character. So yeah, uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon is explicitly a World War II propaganda film. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the horrible things that come with that genre of, of propaganda film. It, it, it's, it's very much – uh, uh, England will persevere in the wake of this, you know, complete with foam rocks in the middle of the streets because that's how rubble works apparently. Um, uh, the, it was nominally a rewrite of an original story because they found that if they could say it was inspired by a Conan Doyle story that sold more. And yet the inspiration – they chose the, the, um, uh, the Adventure of the Dancing Men, and the only thing that comes from that story is the fact that the code involves – little stick figures of dancing men. And even how the code is done is completely different from how it was done in the story. <laughs> um, so they, they, they got the bare minimum of inspired by from the story and then moved on. And also the worst part about this film is that code is the only actual mystery that gets solved in the entire fucking movie. It's yeah. not even a mystery. It's an action film in the worst possible case. Um, uh, uh, but I mean this film is great because it showcases everything that is wrong about the Basil Rathbone era, to my opinion. They have a Watson who is pathologically stupid. Um, he, it, the, uh, ah. the, the main character that they're supposed to keep an eye on comes to, to join Baker Street. Holmes says, I gotta go. Watson, keep an eye on him. And Watson, within 10 seconds, has fallen asleep. <laughs> yes. And not even with, a time lapse falls asleep. He sits on the still. couch and falls asleep. <laughs> yeah, with, 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 with his gun still drawn. That, that, yes, that exactly. That did make me chuckle. It's like, I mean, th this is the thing, and I, I, it's, excuse me, because I'm not an aficionado on these. Even though I bought the DVD set, I've, I'm yet to go through them in detail or anything. But was it was it the the fact that with the Nigel Bruce interpretation of of, of Watson that that because because my understanding or, or certainly what I've seen is he is kind of a bumbling buffoon. Yes. Sadly, that, that that's there to make you know Sherlock look even smarter and and all this sort of thing. But it is actually to the point that it's that, that it's almost slapstick by its very nature. Was, was was it like that in all of them, or or is this a you know a particularly bad you know interpretation of um, it, or this, was that across the series? This was it's it, it, all of them had that. Yes, I mean the Nigel Bruce's performance was very much in that vein, partially because Nigel Bruce was a a, a comic actor. Right, um, and so there's a like like there's like 15 movies, is that right? And right, in yeah, that 15 series. Movies. But yeah, also, okay. um, Basil and Nigel were in very long running uh, radio interpretation as well, concurrence to the movies. Right, um, because that was very much the time period where uh, what we call transmedia now, um, which is hey, these actors are really good in one media, so let's do do a very similar thing in another media with the same actors because people will follow and go, oh, I I saw I heard them in the radio, now I want to go spend money to actually go see them in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the kind of the direction they wanted to go. Um, but Nigel comes off better in the radio show because the the structure of the radio show is closer to uh, the original stories. Um, uh, uh, Watson's actually telling a story. He's an older Watson. is telling the story from the contemporary era. So basically, it's set in the 30s and 40s. But he's telling the story of what happened in the Victorian era. Right. Um, and he's telling it to uh, another person who is actually the the Basically, the appetizer. He's the person who gives. You know, they, they they always try to work in a reference to Petri wine or whatever um, uh, during the course of the storytelling. But so it's Watson telling the story, and also even in the radio show because the slapstick's not obviously not going to work on radio. A lot of it's more verbal gags, and there's only so many ways that you can do Watson going, huh? Um, so he gets off a little better in the radio show just because of the limitations of radio and the fact that Watson has the chance to kind of validate himself at the beginning and end of the episode because he's the one telling the story. Um, and then the original Victorian era movies were very much done in the same vein as the radio show in the sense that it was, it was not Watson telling the story, but he, they were still writing it as if it were the radio show. So a lot of the visual humor did not make its way into the film. Uh, so he, he gets off. He's still not smart, um, but uh, you know, he, he does 
managed to get you know a little bit here and there. Um, the fact that his doctor actually a little more relevant in some of the Victorian era films and definitely in the Victorian era stories. Um, a secret weapon is a very good way of showing, however, just how low the character is written by this point. Um, combined with the fact that also Lestrade's in here and is actually even dumber than Watson somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Watson at one point in time is telling Lestrade how stupid he is while Watson himself is in the process of being stupid. <laughs> um, but this, 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 this goes to a larger problem with Holmes' adaptations is that until I'd say probably the 70s or 80s, uh, no one had quite cracked the problem of how do you make deduction look interesting on the screen or on radio. Right. Um, it, it's hard. It, it's really a hard problem. I've struggled with it myself. It's like, how do you make someone who's extremely clever look extremely clever consistently when you're constantly having to crank out script after script after script? Um, and, and, you, and you don't have the visual effects to do overlays of everything like right. they do nowadays. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and that's one thing that, like, um, uh, uh, I would say to some extent, we still haven't quite solved because you have shows like Monk or House or whatever, where a lot of the reason why they're the cleverest person in the room is because supporting cast is unfortunately a bit dim. They're not nearly as bad as Nigel Bruce, but we st it's still an easy solution is if everyone else is a little dumb – and the person, the clever character is very clever, then it's easier to make him appear clever in that context. Um, the B BBC Sherlock series is actually the first one that really kind of cracked that. Watson is about as smart as he is in the show, in the, the novels and in the short stories. Um, but they like said they used the overlays and other visual ways of kind of showing this is how deduction works. The night, the night, or sorry, the um, Guy Ritchie films um, got very close. By having the overlay narration of, of, of Downey Jr. kind of slow motion going through a scene, explaining how he's doing things, and then they fast play through the scene again of him actually doing it. Um, uh, and then they subvert that a little bit in the second film, which was interesting. Um, so it was kind of the, the half step to BBC Sherlock where they actually show it. And I, and I noticed that since 2009, a lot of shows have adapted – that style. Um, elementary is still slightly uh, um, a difference in how they approach it, but also the elementary has it because they actually have very smart writers, um, and so they have the advantage of all the characters can be relatively smart. While Sherlock Holmes still is just a bit above them, but also Sherlock occasionally loses to the supporting cast in terms of being clever. Sometimes he misses the emotional intelligence of the characters. Right. Without yes. without going about elementary again, but the point is is that it's it's a very hard. As a writing, uh, especially when you're writing primarily for audio, which the original movie makers were, um, how do you show mysteries being solved on screen? And the two answers are have your supporting cast be idiots and also not have a mystery. And of course, this movie does both of those beautifully. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, there, but you know, there, there, there's so much more that we can talk about how horrible this film is. I mean, uh, uh, the fact that it is unapologetically jingoistic, um, which granted is what it's trying to – that's the whole point of the film is yeah. Germans are bad. I, I um, like it in the opening scene where they say something about um, speaking English and, they, and, and he says you know, blatantly, oh, don't worry. You'll, you, the, the, the planet will be speaking another language yes. very soon or whatever. I just thought, right. oh, wow, how on the nose could it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gee, I wonder what political party those Germans happen to represent. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, I mean, and it's, uh, you know, the fact that um, the actual uh, uh, case, the, the actual big twist that Holmes figured out is completely arbitrary and stupid because the person's written a code and then he's did a code shift on top of that, um, but only for three lines. And the fourth line, for some reason, he writes backwards because why the hell not? Um, and you know, the fact that Moriarty's in this film and Moriarty is, is himself pretty dumb because he sets an elaborate trap for Holmes that he then runs blindly into himself. After explaining to Holmes what the trap is and where it is, Moriarty somehow falls into it. Yeah, and Moriarty actually, did I, because because I must admit, uh, I kind of wasn't paying full attention to this because because it wasn't the most engaging. <laughs> it is uh, not. And, and, and did, did I get, it, Moriarty actually dies in this film. Is that right? Yes and no. 
Oh, okay. I was good because I was like, "Whoa, hold on, whoa!" Is is no. is main nemesis is dead already? You know. So sort of um, <laughs> that that is uh, uh, it, it, this is the point where um, the films the series really starts to parody itself because the first few films was we have to have Moriarty because that is his known nemesis, um, and then uh, so he becomes inconvenienced or otherwise disappears off screen in relatively believable ways, but he comes back. It's like, well, of course he came back. He's mad. Um, but then as the, sh- the series progresses, Moriarty gets killed off in increasingly obvious ways and yet somehow comes back each time. Um, so we really have uh, uh, the kind of birth of the supervillain death that's happening right. here. And in fact, I would even say that Sherlock Holmes' secret weapon is really Sherlock Holmes written as superhero at this point in time. I mean comic books were just starting to come up at this time, but yeah. the writing is very commensurate to your, your, your Flash Gordon radio shows, your Dick Tracy radio shows. It's the same style of hyperbolic. Um, we have to make it very clear that the villain got defeated, but also – that actor needs to come back for the next movie. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. let's come with it. Even more arbitrary reason why he's back again. Yeah, I, I think it should have been called Sherlock Holmes in disguise, actually, because uh, that, <laughs> yes. that, 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 that seemed to be the main thing about this film was, oh, look at all my different disguises. You know, you don't recognize me, do you, uh, do you Watson? And obviously he doesn't because he's a bumbling fool in this. Right. But yeah, <laughs> it's like... Uh, and I think part of that was um, because uh, uh, Basil actually liked the makeup, and he was, he's like, he was a character actor originally. Yes. Um, yeah. And one of the reasons why he was attracted to Sherlock Holmes was because it was a chance to be a leading man and a character actor in the same role. Um, and one of the reasons why he was approached originally to do the radio show is because he was a great voice actor. Um, so he could take on a different voice, but then – you know. Uh, he changes voice like it was just me Watson. It's like oh, I didn't recognize you there, you know. Um, but in radio, it's very easy to do. But then chance to do it on screen, I actually get the makeup on. He really loved that, and so they kept finding more and more reasons to work this one relatively small aspect of Holmes's character into every possible situation. So I mean, really, you have kind of Sherlock Holmes as the saint at this point um, yes. because he's super spy rather than actually a consulting detective. I mean, he's literally working for the government. Um, he's, he's trying to get the plans for a new kind of bomb back for the government, the U.S. government of all things, which makes no sense. Um, uh, uh, he's in disguise for most of it. He's infiltrating spy rings. It's like there's nothing about this that is, with the exception of one story in the canon, is anything like we've seen Sherlock Holmes, and yet – because these actors always play these characters, therefore it is considered to be a Sherlock Holmes film. You have this thing where you have this kind of weird morphology of over time, of course Baz Rathbone's playing Sherlock Holmes, of course Nigel Bruce is playing Watson because they're just so – those characters in the minds of the popular culture. And this is actually one of the kind of problems with uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes – as we look at him now is because more people recognize Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes rather than the original literary character. A lot of our popular culture perception, people who've never even seen the films, but still our perception of the character ultimately derives from that because that was the hugest kind of impact aside from today of Sherlock Holmes on popular culture. So it's like you have the original stories, wait a few decades, bam, you have the the, the, the films, the, 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 Nigel, the Basil Rathbone films, and then that kind of set the tenor for decades for how you play the character. If you look a lot of the characters in the 50s, 60s, and up until the early 70s, a lot of them are playing a version of, of Basil Rathbone. Right. That was how it was – that is how Holmes is played on screen. Um, and it, it was that's why the um, uh, I mentioned earlier Jeremy Brett. That was why he was such a revelation as an actor because he said, I'm not going – I'm going to play him like he's written in the stories. And it's like what playing him like the original in the, in the canon? That's crazy talk. And, but, and did the, and did they update the way Holmes was pe- played in those as well? Because I, 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 embarrassingly, I'm not I'm not very well uh, versed in the Jeremy Brett thing. Oh, that's I fair. Ought to be. <laughs> so um so uh, uh then the brief digression. Uh, how Jeremy Brett portrayed him is in two parts. First is uh, he added the idea of the addiction to it because if you look nowhere in any of the previous film or media adaptations is 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 the addiction ever mentioned um this was the first series to actually make it a plot point it got written out very quickly because parents were concerned the kids were going to start emulating homes and shooting up heroin because apparently that's what happens <laughs> um so it was written out but it was still referenced um what happened was Holmes 
Beats the Addiction season one, but then every once in a while, Watson will bring it back up, and Holmes say, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. So it's still a part of the character, even though they don't longer show it on screen, and also they show him in a very media interpretation of how addiction works. Um, but separately, they portrayed Holmes as slightly unsympathetic. Um, if you look at the a Secret Weapon, uh, uh, everyone loves Sherlock Holmes. He's very charismatic. He's very again leading man, Hollywood leading man. Everyone loves Holmes. He never when, when he gets when he get, doesn't get along with someone, it's because that person's a bad person. Um, it's not because Holmes is abrasive. The idea of Holmes as mild to moderate sociopath is a relatively new thing, and it ultimately stems from Jeremy Brett's interpretation because right. this is a Holmes that will tell his clients off. This is a Holmes that will interrupt people. This is a Holmes that will laugh at inappropriate times, which does come from the canon, but had never been done on screen before. Um, so that's why. You, so a lot of the, um, like I mentioned, uh, uh, the BBC Sherlock Elementary, they're emulating Jeremy Brett in the same way that the actors of the 60s, 70s um, were emulating Nigel Bruce because Nigel Bruce was the, the Sherlock Holmes, and now Jeremy Brett was Sherlock Holmes. Um, so every, so you have these kind of crowning interpretations of Sherlock Holmes. And I, honestly, I believe that at this point, probably. Um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch will probably be, soon become the way you play Sherlock Holmes on screen going forward because he is similarly iconic in terms of a lot of people. If you ask them now who their favorite Sherlock Holmes is, nearly all of them will say Benedict Cumberbatch in the way that in the 50s and 60s you would have said Nigel – or uh, Basil Rathbone. So, I mean, it, it, it's hard to escape the gravity of this performance, and yet I chose this film because you see Holmes at his – again, it's most almost – it's becoming a parody of itself at this point in the franchise. Um, uh, Holmes is only wrong when it is convenient to the plot, uh, and even then he corrects his own mistakes, so no one can tell him he's wrong. He can only tell himself he's wrong. Uh, uh, his – Interpretations and his deductions are basically out of thin air, uh, and when there actually is a logic to his interpretation, it's only because everyone around him is just mind-bogglingly dumb. Um, the the actual budget is abysmally small. Um, you know, it, it's 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 very clear. I mean, this is like almost Doctor Who budget in terms of how thin things are. Styrofoam rocks, um, the same street being redressed several different ways. Um, uh, British police officers with American accents. I mean, it's just really not good. Yeah. And nothing in about it. I mean, we you talk about we talked earlier about how you know, oh, this is not my Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes very much goes in its own direction, its own interpretation of Sherlock Holmes, but it's founded in the canon. It comes the fact that the the movie takes time to address inconsistencies of the original stories. Says something about the character, does something interesting with the character. So you have one interpretation of Holmes that is very kind of, of a unique, fresh take, but it comes from something at the core. It, that you still recognize it going, yes, this is a character recognized, even if it's a new interpretation. This does not look anything like Sherlock Holmes, except for the fact that the names are the same. But nothing in this film, if you take this film in isolation, nothing in it would appear to be Sherlock Holmes. It's only because in the context of the other Basil Rathbone interpretations, and then and, and, and that interpretation on the greater media interpretation of Holmes. Do you see Sherlock Holmes in him? Because, of course, Basil Rathbone is Sherlock Holmes. That's the only reason why you see him in this film, because that is how he was. And that's how he was viewed contemporarily. In the time period, you know, he was playing Sherlock Holmes because he was first playing Sherlock Holmes. When he decided he didn't want to do it, they kept giving him more and more money initially because it's like, well, you have to play Sherlock Holmes. And then afterwards, you get the TV interpretations. But a lot of the, especially the early 50s ones, were really just, can we get someone else to do a Basil Rathbone interp uh, impression? Right. Because there was just no other conceivable way of this character being portrayed. Right. A quick question then, because I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I watched this and I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. I thought it was. Um, you know, I thought it was a pretty bad movie uh, in so much as, as, like you said, um, he was just surrounded by idiots and, and, and nothing seemed to sort of really, there was no sort of payoff for anything at all. I mean, um, yeah. you, you know, apart from, like you said, the mirror with the with the dancing men as the code and whatever. But um, this was this was the second one of the of the of the. 1940s set series right mm -hmm. that, that they did were the were the others 
as bad as this? I mean, is it generally a fairly because obviously a lot of people have a lot of funds, you know, for, for Basil Rathbone, like you said, he, right. he was he was synonymous with Sherlock Holmes for so long. Um, but are the other movies uh, also quite bad or is it just this one particular one that, that, that stands out as a bit of a steamer? Um, to be honest, they, uh, some, a lot of them blur together because there were 15 of them. Um, uh, uh, and so it's hard to kind of pull them apart. I, I, I will say first off that one of the reasons why this one sticks out in my memory and why I point people to it is it's one of the few that's fallen into the public domain. So even the people who made the film weren't that keen to necessarily keep the copyright up on it. So I think it tells you something about the film itself. Uh, but that said, the later ones get a little better, I think, because they start to, while they couldn't, while it was not a movement they recognized at the time, it starts to incorporate elements of noir. Um, the woman in green is probably the one that stands out to me the most in that vein. Um, so you, if you have Sherlock Holmes being a 40s era detective um, in the 40s, uh, it's and you're making films in that that uh, B movie, um, the B movie st studio system, like the other noir films are being made in. It's inevitable that some of that visual language is going to start to seep into those films, right. um, because the same people working in the same area. And even though these are kind of the the um, the action film side of things, you know, you're not getting into the uh, the the grittiness and the character drive of some of the the crime dramas of the uh, the proper noir movement, um, the visual language is still there, and so you start to see a bit more of that pacing, a bit more of that writing, seep its way into the Sherlock Holmes series, and so it becomes interesting in a very different way. Um, uh, so they're a little better to watch because. From a modern perspective, we're a little more trained in recognizing noir um, and how it's positioned inside the larger uh, meet, uh, movie tradition. Um, mm -hmm. So I think th those end up aging better inadvertently. Um, uh, but you know, also there's a film where Watson gets stuck in a bucket for half the film. So I mean, you know, you you, you gotta take what you can get. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair. And, and and the two they did previously, which were the. Uh... The Victorian set ones. Those are, are better. Are those those are better, are they? Okay, because what well, yeah. one of them's an adaptation of Hound of the Baskervilles, isn't it? Right. Um, yeah. I think. But yeah, I mean, interestingly, I've just grabbed the box, looking at the um, the, the 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 DVD collection. Um, this one, you know, Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon, is one of the few in the box set that doesn't actually have an audio commentary by a, a, a Sherlock expert so uh that probably says something right there yes. yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, it's one of those uh, the reason why I, I pick it also is because um it's it's it, it's it's a very forgettable film as you you yourself noticed i mean it's like you, you you almost forget you watched it um and so it's a good representative example of it's not one of the the tent poles like i said there's the two uh victorian era films and then like i said woman in green is probably the big post one um in fact the woman in green is the film that gets parodied in mr holmes another reason why i kind of chose these two films as a set is because you have mr holmes you have sir ian mckellen kind of criticizing the the um the the that era that that interpretation of holmes and then you watch a film from an era and you go now he's got a good point <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like there, there's, yeah. there's a lot of validity as to why Holmes is pissed off at this interpretation. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's good to watch these two kind of as a pair because <laughs> you, you actually get some legitimate criticism from the Mr. Holmes interpretation as to the 40s interpretation was not great. And the, 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 the parody version they put together for that movie – is not too far off from the actual films. Once you watch it, you go, it's like, it can't possibly be that bad. And you watch it, it's like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> maybe I was wrong. Yeah. Did, did you watch this one, Simon? Ah, uh, no. It was pretty bad. It's on um, YouTube. It is an yeah, hour long. Yeah, and if you yeah. have a pint, it is only an hour. Pro. Yeah. It, it's, it's not, even though it's classed as a feature. Yeah. It mm. is only just over about an hour and eight minutes long, I think. Yep. But, um, uh yeah it's 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 it was a pretty hard watch I, I i found i have to say i dozed off a couple of times during it and then i found myself checking emails and doing yep. other things while it was playing which is never a good sign i'm like yep. well no, you know, i'm not engaged sign. here so um but, but but yeah you're right i can see how it would sort of fall fall into the sort of 
you know, you know, the the, the film serial dramas were were, were very popular um, at the time, weren't they? The film serials and and stuff, right. and I and I could see where uh, it, it it would sort of fit into that, you know, before the sort of you know proper film noir movement and and and, and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. This, this was definitely a time period where it was um, we used to get a film out because people were expecting a Sherlock Holmes film at about this time, and it will make X amount of money. Um, uh, as opposed to okay, well, we've done a lot of these. Let's let's maybe try some new things and explore some some different visual language. And to be fair, I have to kind of watch them again because it's been years since I watched the other ones because some of them are really hard to get through. But I will say, after having just spent twenty minutes, uh, uh, you know, lamenting this, there's a reason why those two actors are still remembered fondly and still beloved. There's a reason why they put their stamp on cultures because while I may not like the way Watson is written. Nigel Bruce does a great job of working with what he's got. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same with Basil Rathbone. It's like they definitely are – if you watch the film, they're the only two actors you probably even remember from the film afterwards because everyone else is so mediocre compared to those two. And it's not because nobody else is acting. It's because those two are just such phenomenal actors even though they're working with an awful script and they're ter- and in terrible environments. But you still see them trying to give their all, and if you listen to your radio yeah. shows, it's the same way. It's like the, 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 their voices, you remember them. One of my favorite bits, if you can dig it up, um, the old radio shows, because they didn't have reruns, uh, they would sometimes redo, you know, actually recast the scripts and, and basically reproduce old episodes. Um, at one time, as, as a joke, I think it was April Fool's Day, um, they had Nigel Bruce reading the Sherlock part. <laughs> and Basil Rathbone reading the Watson part, and it starts off like the first couple of minutes are relatively poor, and then they start making fun of each other's performance styles, and it becomes insanely hilarious. But you you have this weird thing of like Nigel Bruce makes a half decent Sherlock Holmes, you know? Oh, wow. Okay, is that, is that available? Is that, um, is that it's really that? hard to find. Um, but if you go to like um archive.org they have a bunch of the original radio shows available there, mm-hmm. um, and uh, there's uh, it's been a couple of years, but there was. Uh, and there's a number of different compilations of specifically the the Rathbone Bruce uh, run, and in there usually you'll see a kind of uh, a 20 minute episode of like you know uh, of them reversing the parts. I think it was 47, I want to say, that around this was happened. So if you, you archive.org or any of the other old time radio websites where they preserve the now public domain performances, um, you can probably find it in one of those collections. But it it is. I mean, I do recommend actually if you listen to the radio shows. A lot of them are again written for their time period. The mysteries are not great, but you know, every once in a while, especially when they do the original show, uh, uh, stories like um, um, uh, uh, the Speckled Band is a good one actually. Um, you can start to really see these actors are actually really, really good. It's just the writing because there is so such huge demand. The writers are just cranking out scripts as fast as possible, yeah. and trying to make these films as fast as possible. When you can see that happening, but the, when you get to the start of both the radio and the movie run, you can see that, wow, these actors are actually really good, and there's a reason why um, uh, these, 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 these performances stuck in the creative consciousness or the, the popular consciousness for so long. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you know, when I watched Sherlock Holmes in New York a couple of months back, um, Patrick McNee's uh, portrayal of, of Watson in that kind of made me think of of Nigel Bruce mm-hmm. you know I, I I'm not sure if he was inspired by him or not but it had that kind of you know you know look and feel about it um you know more so than we than we've had with any of the sort of more recent um adaptations yeah but, uh, de- definitely you could tell um the kind of uh the the you know throat clearing or uh, yeah uh, you know, the kind of harumphing portrayal definitely stems from uh, uh the Nigel Bruce camp um, because before that, the few media interpretations we have of Sherlock Holmes, um, you, don't, you don't really get that style of of of, of cadence and that structure. Um, and then it start, and then that version of Watson kind of goes away right around the '80s. Um, but even if you watch like Young Sherlock Holmes, if you, now all this, if you were to watch Young Sherlock Holmes again, you can see elements of the Nigel Bruce interpretation a little bit in the Young Watson. Um, kind of, you know, his the, the fact that he's overweight, for example, the, the fact that Watson's weight is really only a remnant of the Nigel Bruce version. Um, it's yeah. not really a thing in the canon at all. Um, and later versions don't really go into it. But when you get the kind of the overweight 
Watson, the clumsy Watson, all that stems from Nigel Bruce's performance. Um, and so you can see every once in a while bits and elements of it because because it's it and, and same thing with the um, extremely eloquent, very charismatic Holmes. A lot of that again comes from uh, uh, the Basil Rathbone interpretation, the kind of very elegant Englishman, uh, the gentleman's gentleman portrayal. Um, uh, you get a lot of of that. Uh, and again, still every now and then, in some interpretation, even modern interpretations, you still occasionally get a kind of a Rathbone flair from it. So I mean, these 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 interpretations, you know, have really shaped everyone's perception for good and for bad. Um, but every time, every once in a while, someone's like, going, "No, not Basil Rathbone is the best version of Sherlock Holmes." Is like going, "Okay, defend this movie." And usually the conversation kind of stops at that point. That's why <laughs> I get in fights online about this because everyone's like going, "No, Basil Rathbone's amazing." It's like, "Yes, but." <laughs> Please defend the secret weapon, and they just can't. Mm-hmm. It's, there's no defense for that film. Right, no, I, I'd agree. <laughs> so, Simon, don't waste your time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, see, see a better adaptation instead. There's yeah. plenty oh, of them okay. out there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, you know, that's great. Um, one thing I will say actually is just gone back to the uh, the, the the Sherlock um, TV. Uh, movies or whatever you want to call them. Um, one of the things personally I was a bit disappointed with, I have to say, was I thought uh, a couple of Christmases back, the idea of um, taking that cast and putting them into the Victorian setting mm-hmm. uh, for a Christmas special was was a really great idea. And I thought to myself, oh, yeah, you know, this, th- th- why not? You know, that that will be a lot of fun and, and, and really good. Um what I actually had a problem with is something that I'm normally a massive proponent of actually is the fact that they then tried to sort of tie that into the, <laughs> to, to the, <laughs> yes, uh, right. you know, the contemporary um, mm. timeline and, and episode and, 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 you know, essentially it means the outcome of that, that whole thing was, um, you know, Sherlock in a plane for, for 20 minutes or whatever. Right. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I actually, was disappointed because I really I was really with them with what they were doing by uh, you know taking that cast but sticking it in the uh, in the Victorian era and I thought that was brilliant and uh, but I was really disappointed that they chose to tie that into the um, the, the 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 main narrative and I just wondered yeah. whether I'm just being extra sad or, or or how you guys felt about that. I'll be honest <laughs> when I when I when I saw it um, I I, I realized I, right before then I was like. Maybe the show I'm, I'm I'm kind of souring on. I'm not sure. Maybe it's just, you know, it was a rough season or whatever. Um, and then I saw this Christmas special and I realized I want to see that show more than I want to see the contemporary show at this point in time. And I think that's what frustrated me the most is because at the end of it, it's like going, oh yeah, but we have to watch this show instead. And it's like ah, oh. <laughs> because the other one was you're right. It was so brilliant. It was like oh man, I, I could do a, a season, just a whole season of this, or even just you know one full movie, you know another one just like that because just. I, I feel like it's like it, it's it's so obviously a pastiche and a love letter to not only the Jeremy Brett interpretation but just the original Sherlock Holmes as a whole, and it's like just just do that, just make it a complete one-off thing, end it in its own sense. Don't even explain it. Just you know, never reference it again. Just make yeah. it kind of a cool thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I wanted it to be just a one-off standalone. But as I said, they tried to tie it in, which normally I'm all for that. If you can tie mm-hmm. something in to the continuity, I like it. But in this case, I just thought, oh no, that's that's really crap. You know, yeah. <laughs> and I was a bit disappointed by that episode. What, what about you, Simon? Did you see that one? Yeah, I did. Or have um, I ruined it for you? No, 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 no. I, <laughs> I, 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 listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, I, I remember seeing it, and I remember um, equally being sort of puzzled with the way they tied it in. It was just like, yeah, it would have just been cool just to be its its own thing. Yeah, you know? it was Moffat being Moffat just for the sake of it, wasn't it? I was like, yeah. mm. that's... Uh, mm. Anyway, <laughs> but you have you have made me, um, Eddie, by coming on this, you have made me think that I need to uh, to go back and um, pick up a game with elementary, you know, where I left yeah. off, because, um, you, you know, for, for someone who 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 is, you know, quite an aficionado on the works and, and, a, and a and a fan of the original works, um, mm-hmm. 
you, you know, to to speak this way about elementary is 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 quite surprising and refreshing, and it makes me think, oh well, you know, because I quite enjoyed it for what it was, but um, yeah. uh, you know, as I said, I just lost lost track of it along the way, and I feel like maybe I should go back and um, and 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 pick up where I left off with those if yeah, if I can I, find time. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I mean, what I would do is, especially if you're trying to binge watch it, I, I've I've not with the show, with other shows where it's like, I want to follow it, but not every ep- not every minute is gripping. Um, is like, pop your laptop open, maybe check emails while it's playing. So, okay, this is a bit of the crime scene stuff. I don't care about this stuff. And oh, hey, you know, actors I care about are back on the screen. So you're gonna, you know, d- dip in and out. That does kind of help to to. You yeah, know, because yeah. It, it's fair, these are designs for people that are only kind of half paying attention to the show. So I mean, it's right, not actually right. a, a problem. It's actually part of the intent of the show. Yeah, I mean, with those sort of shows, I always just, you know, I'm a bit, a bit sad, but I always prefer the, um, the what I class as the mythology shows yes. over the sort of uh, procedure of the week shows. You know, uh, I can sort of take and, and leave those those ones, but the ones that actually sort of develop the character and the relationships and all that stuff, they're the ones that I always want to kind of go back to. So, um, uh, and, and I guess, yeah, there's enough material online now that probably highlight those, those as I class them, mythology episodes, and, and uh, you, you can do it without having to sit through everything. Yeah. Right. And also, <laughs> and I know that a couple of um, uh, websites, I know uh, Wired a while ago did a binge watching guide, which is basically along the lines of here are the mythology episodes you need to watch to follow the show so um maybe do a search for binge watching guide maybe that way you can kind of just okay skip all the irrelevant episodes and just hit the, the main ones because they, they do enough recaps as well at the beginning so that way if there's like one scene stuck in a procedural show that you need to catch up on the recap will usually catch you up on all that yes yeah yeah you know they're quite good at that for for that uh for that market but uh interesting well um have you got anything to add, Simon? Sorry. No, I don't. <laughs> no, no, it's it's, um, it's been a thoroughly interesting uh, listen. Oh, good. Yeah, yes. no, it really has. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, uh, you know, I I, I want to give you the opportunity as well to sort of give your work a plug. Um, so if 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 people want to read more, hear more, see more, or find out more, where 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 can they reach you, Eddie? Absolutely. Well, if they if if they want to just if you want to get more of my kind of ranting about Sherlock Holmes, um, the best kind of form of that is I wrote a book called Watson is Not an Idiot, um, which you can buy on uh, you know, Waterstones, um, Amazon, uh, most actually online markets at this point. Um, and basically, it's I go through each of the canonical stories, kind of give a, a, a bit of a summary, but not too much. But mainly, I give context for a modern audience to what those original stories are trying to do and contrast it with some of the media interpretations. That's actually where the uh, title comes from, is to contrast the, the Nigel Bruce interpretation with the actual canonical Watson and how he appears in the short stories. So it is very much me talking, much like in this vein, but going through each story and novel and uh, analyzing it. Um, I have a copy in front of me. Although oh, I excellent. Confe- uh, although I confess it only arrived last week, so I haven't, <laughs> so I haven't actually started reading any of it yet, but will. Fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Um, and it's, it's a relatively short read. It's like, oh, I, I think it's only 150 pages in the being. Something like that. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I do have a website called uh, Eddie Fate, E D D Y F A T E dot com. That is my blog uh, and main website. Um, and uh, occasionally I'll talk about Sherlock Holmes stuff on there. It's been a while, but I do have an entire category called Sherlock Holmes. Um, and back at season two of Elementary, I actually went through each episode and talked about the canonical connections between Elementary and the original shows because it's one where there are more than people think, even though there's not as many as say bbc sherlock um and i also talk about some other sherlock Holmes stuff as well every now and then uh and then uh for my professional work um not only do i have eddiefate.com but also my freelance company uh pugsteady.com um and that has references to uh, my main game uh pugmire as well as some of the other clients i've worked for and some of the other projects i've worked on excellent and uh keith where can people find your work Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about my stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, if, you go, if you go to YouTube and put in British Isles, that's E Y L E S, as in my last name, 
you can find short films there that I've written, produced and directed. Uh, so, you know, check those out, comment, whatever you want. I don't mind. It's all good. Uh, feedback's always good. Um, and to see any other bits of work, put my name into IMDB and you can see things uh, past, present and even future. <laughs> and as always, you can find my work at independentrunnings.com. Uh, you can find this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube and all good podcast providers. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Just search Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. And uh, please do leave us a review and rating on iTunes and Stitcher. It all helps. So uh, just leaves me to thank uh, Eddie for coming on uh, and talking about Sherlock Holmes. No, thank you. I, I had a wonderful time. And uh, I hope that uh, you, the listener, can join us again for the next episode of Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. <laughs>